Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome to the next episode of the series where we're going to be talking about feminism, a very important topic of course and one that is uh, very crucial to the discourse. So before we begin inshallah we're going to start with the poem, the London air poem in the Arabic language or that part of the poem which specifically relates to feminism and then we're going to come back and do a sharh or an explanation of it. للاستوى بين الرجال والنساء ثم لها مراحل تعد ثلاثة لأجلها تعدوا أولها في الانتخاب طالبت فسمحوا لها وبعد شاركت وبعدها قمن بما تقوم رجالهم ورمن ما تروم حتى رأينا أن من في البيت عاملة في سجنها المقيت وبعدها طالبنا باستواء بلا تفاوت ولا انتهاء so this part of the poem is discussing the different waves of fo feminism. As people will be aware, there are different waves. There's the first wave of feminism, the second wave, third wave, and so on. First, first wave feminism is really uh, a wave of feminism which relates to enfranchisement of women. So this is really a cause-based wave. You know, the, the main thing here was voting. And uh, before that, actually, you could say you had Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote A Vindication of Women's Rights, and that was in response to Rousseau actually and if you it's really interesting to see the kind of things that Mary Wollstonecraft was asking for in the book she wasn't asking for the same kind of thing that we find in second wave feminism and she was not asking for the f kinds of things we see obviously in third wave feminism so the kind of things that we're talking about education these kind of things but then it was all about the vote a and so in 1918 a group of European countries a group of European countries uh, became uh, well, allowed the vote for women. Obviously, uh, 1919 and 1920, uh, countries like Canada and Britain and so on, they also joined that, that group of countries. So you could say, in, in general, in, from the years 18, 1918 to 1920, enfranchisement or, or woman suffrage became an issue that was on the table and became solved. And many people had uh, become uh, well, uh, these countries had actually allowed the woman, uh, woman's vote. So, <coughs> actually, w w we have to be specific here that it's still in the UK, women over the age of 18 couldn't vote. Couldn't vote. This happened later on, I think it was 1929. Uh, it was actually women that were the over the age of 30 that could vote in 1918. So this is very important. <coughs> it's not just the case, though, that first wave feminism had an impact, right, on... Um, on the vote. This is probably a misconception. There were other issues which relate to uh, discourse which are very important that this had an impact on. Of them is the age of consent, actually, which is a huge thing, especially from our perspective because of the discussion of, you know, the Prophet's uh, marriage to Aisha and all these kinds of things. In the year 1929, the age of consent changed from 12 years old for women, in the, in the UK we're talking about, to um, 16. Okay, uh, th th there was a change in the age of consent. Now the question is, why did that change take place? And you've got to look at, obviously, the historical timeline. This is after World War I. World War I took place between 1914 to 1918. And there were, there's the Liberal government came into power and they had policies of development. They were trying to develop the country again, infrastructurally and educationally. And if you look at the reasons why, you know, um, the age of consent moved, a lot of it was actually pegged on education. So education became, and uh, look at this now, I mean, we consider a child a child until they finish school. So the age of consent, really, the, the, the notion of how a child is conceived, it, it was actually differentiated in this time period. It was absolutely the norm. This is less than 100 years ago, actually. Less than 100 years ago. I just want you to think about that, right? It was absolutely a norm for a 12-year-old to be... I was actually in the books. It was allowed for a 12-year-old to have in intercourse and so on. So the, the thing that really changed this was the pressure of the feminist movement and then obviously because England had been what it was, Britain had been what it was in terms of its colonial uh, kind of uh, positioning, countries like India, which if my memory serves me correctly, actually implemented this law before England of the age of consent, had already been influenced by that discourse. So first wave feminism, it's not correct to think that the only cause that they kind of had an influence on was enfranchisement or uh, the woman's vote. There was actually other causes, this is one of them. Uh, now, First wave feminism was actually also related to racism. And people don't know this. And it's a very important point to note, yeah, that the main 
kind of founding mothers of first wave feminists, feminism, were racists. And they were racist specifically to black people. You got on your PowerPoints here, if you can see in the... Um, yeah, first wave feminism. Yeah, feminism, yeah. So as you can see, here, it says, um, so it, it's mentioned three women here, Elizabeth Stanton, Millicent, uh, Millicent Fawcett. And by the way, there's something called the Fawcett Society here in the UK named after her, this woman. Uh, she was racist. She didn't mention the lynching. The lynching came from a woman called Rebecca Latimer Felton, who was the first senator of the United States. And by the way, senators are more important than women in the House of Representatives. She was talking about black people being lynched. So th this person that they celebrate in America, they celebrate, and I put the reference there, they celebrate her as the first woman senator. She was saying black people should be, how could they get the vote, she was saying. These blacks, these fools, how can you let these blacks have the vote and not us? This is the understanding because don't forget, black people had the vote before who? Before women did. Black people in America had the vote before women did. And so this woman was saying, how could these blacks have the vote? You should lynch them instead of giving them the vote and not us. So when women in this country and in other places, they associate themselves with this and hundred years of, I remember just some time ago, hundred years of, you know, um, enfranchisement and voting and, this, and the first wave and they, and you, and you'll be taught this. They don't tell you that these are colonial racial people, that they were talking about lynching blacks. This is in the historical record. It's not something which uh, is a, it's a, it's an open secret, if you like. You know? So there's two or three things we need to understand. Yes, they influenced the discourse, but they did so for privileged purposes. They believed in entitlement. They were entitled women. They weren't talking about women in other countries in the colonies. They weren't talking about in the developing world. They only cared about themselves, to be quite honest with you. And if they, if they didn't care, if they, it was all a humanitarian and egalitarian ethic, then what about black people that you're talking about lynching? You see, this is a very strong argument if you think about it. And this already, uh, it, it shows us the colonial nature of feminism, okay? And the racial nature of feminism. It really is a colonial elitist discourse, which can be traced back with sources. Uh, You'll be surprised that in the 19th century, there was something called wife selling. These are some things in the UK that, that it was difficult for some people to, to divorce their wives. Very difficult to divorce their wives. All they do, they go and sell them in the you know, market. They used to sell. Now this, by the way, we don't want to be, you know how people are orientalist towards Muslim narratives. and We don't want to be the same. This was not a law, for, for as, far, as far as I know. It's not a law in, in, in British statutes. But it was something that was practiced up until the 19th century. So you can see why this would aggravate women. They would actually literally, if you look online and see how wife's selling, you know, they, they would literally be tied up, put like, you know, this thing on their face and like, and literally like animals, and come and sell my wife and this and that. They had all kinds of practices, by the way. If a woman wanted to get a divorce in, uh, you know, 18th century Britain, uh, and she had to prove that her husband was impotent sexually, there was a practice that they used to go to court, and she used to have intercourse with her husband to show that she couldn't finish the job. And the, court, the judge was there to see. So they had all these kinds of weird practices. Well, it's not very weird now, actually. This is something that's revived itself in different ways uh, in the current time. But this is uh, weird practices, of course, from a legal perspective is what I mean. But the, and that's really the backdrop of the feminist movement, why it came about uh, contextually. Any questions here? Sorry, yeah, you know yeah. you mentioned Elizabeth Stanton and Millicent? Fawcett, yeah. What, these were the two who you said... Uh, the so they were, they, had, they were racists. They were the founders of... So they were key figures in the in first wave feministic discourse. Uh, um, the other one, Stanton, that I've mentioned, the, f the last one, she's the one who talked about lynching black people. She was to the first senator in America. She was the one who said lynch, used the term lynch. Okay, so who's the founder? Yeah. Could they, if you're saying it's uh, linked to racism, yes. could the feminists say this is a one person, one opinion? No, this is not one person, one opinion. This was a movement, yeah. This was, this was, there's actually papers written on this. It's, it's quite easy to find the papers written on this. It was it was a it was a discourse that was actually cross national. Like even in the UK, you had the racists. In America, you had different. Like the <laughs> it was surprisingly uh, a popular opinion to be racist as a feminist at that time. It was surprisingly popular opinion. I've given three names, but there are others we can give. You said the first female senator. Is it Latimer Felton or the top one? The Stanton is the first senator. The, the last time I mentioned the slide. Interestingly, there's something called the Fawcett Society here in the UK. It's one of the major feminist societies named after this racist woman. Anyways, put, put that to the side. So we talked about uh, suffrage. Uh, we talked about the countries. Now, I've, I've, put, uh, I've put something interesting here, which is uh, some examples of legal and logical reasoning. So this is uh, uh, Rue versus Rue or something. It's called Rue versus Rue. And this is something that I saw that was, uh, it seemed to be like a, a judgment. And this is why 
uh, marriage of someone under 16 is seen as abhorrent at this time. I found it quite interesting. So according to modern thought, already is telling us w what's going on, it is considered socially and morally wrong that persons of an age at which we now believe, so he's, he's already telling us, now we believe, when was now? 20 years ago, literally, yeah? Or whatever it may have been. Uh, we now believe to be immature and provide for their education. So education's at the center. Remember, so now adulthood is connected to what? Education. If you haven't finished your GCSEs, you're not an adult somehow, right? If you, th that's the idea. Oh, they don't have GCSEs then, but the, the, the idea is your adulthood and your maturity is connected to your education. And once again, the education became a big thing because the liberal government wanted to develop the country. So we have to understand that that is their standard, okay? And it's very difficult to moralize on this basis because you can see clearly the historical development in this country and other countries where it started to be moralized that actually this was a, a, this was a, a decent age for marriage or intercourse and this was not a decent age for marriage and intercourse. It's not really a biological or physiological thing where they, you know, say, this is really pegged strongly on education or lack thereof. So you're just saying that these three people, they contributed to the finding of first wave feminism yes. and they were racist. Yes, yes, is yes. That, is that what we're going on? That's what we're saying right now, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, th that's f remember, first wave feminism isn't really the influential one if you want to call it that, right? And that's why we're going to segue now into second wave feminism, okay? And this is where it really is interesting. It really, really is interesting because second wave feminism is, it happened in the 60s, okay? America and the UK, the civil rights movement. And this is where women obviously came out and said, we're, not, we're on equal pay, uh, talked about abortion, all these things, no problem, okay? But it's also when you had this drudgery, you had this... Um, this uh, almost disdainful, if you like, you know, tone towards domesticity. And so a woman being in the home, in fact, a mother, uh, uh, you know, a mother became uh, the subject of attack. You know, all of the major, th you want three main names that you need to know about second wave feminism in terms of academics. Number one is Simone de Beauvoir. The second one is Betty Friedan. And for the sake of argument, why not put Germaine Grey there as well? Right? Yeah. Jimmy Gray, who's still active, by the way, she's still about talking and stuff like that, and talking, you know, being controversial. You know, so these three women have published works. The two probably most notable works that you need to be aware of is Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique, 1963, and Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex. These are the two. It's like their Quran and Sunnah. Sorry to put it in that. That's that a, it's, it's like you know their, their main. You want to put it, you know, their, their main academic, you know, uh, works. Sorry. I believe it is, yeah. Um, the names are on the, on the slide, yeah? If not, we'll... we'll uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it will be on the second uh, thing. So we, t we wrote Feminine Mystique. And Feminine Mystique is where the famous line, the comfortable concentration, the home is a comfortable concentration camp. What was it, um, uh, Abdul Rahman, in the poem? Amilatun fi sijn hal maqiti. So it's been translated. It's very, uh, you know... Uh, that she's she is a you know prisoner in her house by the way she actually retracted this very interesting in her book called second stage which she wrote some 10 years after or something like this she said this was a bit extreme for me to say that people don't realize she made a, a hell of a lot of retractions why does she make retractions i'll tell you why she made retractions she made retractions because in the, in the year 1970 she wrote a book called the second stage you can you can get this book and she realized by doing these kind of sociological investigations that women were actually having things worse. That things were getting worse for women. I'm going to read something from her book right now. She said that women are experiencing more signs of psychological stress than women in their 20s and 30s had in the 50s and early 60s, she admits. Listen to what she says. And were more likely to feel on edge of a nervous breakdown than young men, she said. So this is after what? After the Civil Rights Movement, after the implementation of Equal Rights Act, after women are going to work, after all of the, the discussion about feminism, after women were burning bras, after, after, after. So she goes and checks to see if women are happy now because of what she's done. And she realized that actually women are sad or they're worse off. Their welfare has been affected in the negative. And she says that she admits this in her book, The Second Stage, which, by the way, you don't find in curricula. You don't find in syllabi, this book, Second Stage. You find feminine mystique. Even in second, GCSE and A-levels, they don't teach any kids about the second stage. It's a book she wrote. And in fact, it's a book she wrote after the book Feminine Mystique. But because it has all these admissions, these dirty admissions, 
that she puts and she tells us the truth about, you don't want to. We don't want to. We want to hide this under the carpet, do we? Women thirty-five to thirty-nine, one in three. She says in the same book, in the nineteen seventies, experienced a nervous breakdown, which was at, is more than a ten percent increase, which is in sociological terms quite heavy. So she realized based on her own study, this is Betty Friedan we're talking about, that more women were suffering after the implementation of all of these things and after they go into work and after they, she's, they've, they've taken up all these attitudes towards domestic, domesticity and the family and the home and the motherhood and all these things, you see. And she even admits, quite interesting in the book, she goes, women have a profound human impulse to have children. Well, you weren't saying that before. All the tone has changed now, has it? When you see women are suffering and coming to you and crying in nervous breakdowns, now you're saying, well, actually women have a profound instinct, she says, or impulse, sorry, to have children. Well, you weren't saying that before, Fredan. She realizes what she put women in. But is she the only one? You'll be surprised she's not the only one. In 1981, after realizing the troubling psychological impact of women, Fredan states this. Let me just go with Fredan for a second. She says, we, ha we had better find a change. But change is hard because listen to what she says. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable what she says. Listen to this. She goes, because women have almost a religious feeling about the woman's movement. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. She says, well, we've got to change this now. This is 20 years after everything. She goes, because women now are becoming, it's like feminism has become religion. Who's saying that? Betty Friedan, one of the founding mothers of feminism. She goes, she goes I realize we have to make a change. She's saying this. I realize we have to make a change, but what? But we, we, it's difficult now because women have a what? A religious feeling towards feminism. Can you imagine this? A sacredness, a reverence, an awe. This is what she continues. It keeps us from asking questions about what really matters to women now. So, you see, it's really negatively impacted women. She realizes that. She wants to change that, but she can't because she's already created a monster. She's already created the Frankenstein of feminism. She's already helped contribute to that. And now she's trying to pull women back. Actually, we're going too far. No, it's too far. The Frankenstein has already been created and, and do you know who's, who's suffering for it? Women are suffering more because of it. And what one of the most powerful things I've ever read from a feminist is from Jermaine Greer in her book 1981, The Whole Woman. Remember, Jermaine Greer was one of the founding mothers of feminism. See her, see her online. How she's coming with arrogance and talking and smoking cigarette and this and that. And she's, she's with confidence talking about how important it is and attacking domesticity, attacking this and equality and all that kind of... And then what? She comes in 1981, she goes, I mourn for my unborn babies. I mourn for my unborn babies, she says. This is, this is two of your big names. Two already. We're going to come to the third one, which is the worst one, by, by the way. Which she said, I mourn for my unborn babies, she said. She goes, I still have pregnancy dreams. She, this, <laughs> she's exposing herself. Waiting with vast joy something that will never happen. Because she's over, she's uh, past the age of pregnancy. Never happen. Allahu Akbar. It's a punishment for you. Because you were telling all the women, it's like you were telling all the women that motherhood is X, Y, Z, and all that. Now you'd be punished because you realize that actually you suppressed your instinct and you hurt yourself. You only hurt you. You're playing with fire. You played with fire and you got burnt. De Beauvoir, who is the one? If you want to, if you want to put the main, the main woman of feminism in the second wave is De Beauvoir, the second sex, because it, it had been probably the most robust and thorough philosophical work that had been done on feminism. And up until the third wave, it was the main way in which uh, scholars of feminism would argue for feminism. Okay, this is what she says. We know her, we know her thought, right? She she attacks the institution of motherhood. She attacks uh, domesticity. She 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 talks about you know how it's oppressive to be a, you know a man and biologically even uh, and these things. But she says the following. She goes. She was talking about, she had a boyfriend, his name was Satra, John Paul Satra, a huge philosopher, big name. Imagine now, she's telling women not to have what? Husbands or this, she's telling them not to have husbands, yeah? Not to be married, not to have kids. But listen to what she says about her own boyfriend, listen to what she said. She goes, I felt dominated by someone else intellectually. Satra lived up to the man I had dreamt up until 15. I was simply not in his class. Wallahi, I have not seen one single Muslim woman to ever say that with the most complementarian lifestyle. She's an egalitarian. She said, I've never heard anything. I was dominated by my husband. I was not even in his class. The most traditionalist woman, the Amish, I've never said, this is what? So you're telling women not to have uh, kids. You're telling women not to, she's like the devil. Wallahi, she is like shaitan. Sorry, let me just go into religious discourse for that. 
مثله كمثل الشيطان إذ قال للإنسان كفر فلما كفر قال أنا بريء منك It's like this in the Quran it says that it's like him like the devil he says go and do this belief and when he does it he says I have got nothing to do with you in her own life what's she doing she's saying you're my superior I'm not even in your class but she what she's writing in her books as what she's writing don't get married don't have children don't allow this from the man it's like this nonsense hypocrite she's a nonsense hypocrite That's what well, she wasn't even married. Uh, we'll, come, we'll come on to it. She wishes she was. As she even admits. Well, not this, but she goes, I was simply not in his class. She, she looked in the mirror. Just like you, Ali Dao. She, she said something that you said. She said, I detest my own reflection. <laughs> <laughs> she goes, if at least my own thought had given birth to a hill, a rocket, but nothing had, has taken place. I'm astonished to realize how thoroughly I have been cheated. Cheated by who? Who are you talking about? You cheated by uh, yourself. You cheated yourself. Yeah? She's writing her autobiography. She thought we didn't read. She got, she <laughs> then she also admits, she's, I don't know, she, she thinks it's a diary entry. She writes the following. She goes, she, b before her boyfriend, Satra, came from Paris, she goes, she was preparing her new independent home in Paris and waiting for the return of Satra from Paris. New furniture is brought, the walls are uh, papered, and new clothes are purchased. Oh, you're trying to make an effort for him, are you? You're trying to make an effort for him, are you? But you tell the woman to what? Not to get married. But you wish you were married. You wish you had that commitment. He called her. One time he said to her, because you know she came back home, she wasn't there. She said, you're like a mere housewife. And obviously in their understanding, this is a huge uh, embarrassment. She says, I was furious with myself to have disappointed him in this way. And you know, he's the one, by the way, if you look at her autobiography, who persuaded her. He's the one who persuaded her to write the second sex. So we have a valid question here. Was second wave feminism created by Satra, by a man? Was he the one doing all the work? Was he the one uh, pushing her to do these things? Why? Because it, it's in the benefit. We're going to come to realize. It's in the benefit of a man. It is, this is what women don't understand. We, please. Some women do, of course. But some women don't. Feminist women. That feminism, second wave, benefits the man. Psychologically, as we'll find. More than it benefits the woman. He doesn't need to commit. He doesn't need to have kids. He doesn't need to do all those things. He can move from one woman to another. Use and abuse. Lash and dash, he can. This is, uh, this is the situation. But let's not uh, mention that. What, what we should mention is some sociological investigations. And the biggest one that's ever been done, that I know of, is this one that is mentioned. It's mentioned in the poem as well. Do you remember what the lines were? Yeah, this is the Dirasa Gharbiya that's been through. Fi mi'atin. Fi mi'at elf, yeah? This is the mi'at elf. It's Blanche Flower and Oswald. This is the name of the study. 2000, okay? 100,000 participants. It's a longitudinal study from the years 1970 to the years 1990 in the UK and the US. Huge study. Very difficult to replicate. And this is what the uh, researchers said. That men are happier and women are sadder. Based in the time period after the feminist movement has taken its force and after all the laws have been placed and after the attitudes have changed and after women are going to work why are they happy and sadder? well because let me tell you why because the, it, they say legislative reform and so on has not been successful in either country in either uh, sorry in either country in creating or uh, in ri ri raising the well-being among women it's, the, the court is messed up a little bit on, on the slides but that's you see E this big thing is saying what? In fact, the same study said, do you know who was getting happier? Men were getting happier. They're getting what they want. The commitment issues have gone down. He doesn't have to extract his resources for her. He can do, he's got more money now. He can just use her, move from woman to woman. She's, she's the one, she wants security. She's the one psychologically primed for these things. You want to play this game with a man and you think you're going to be happier. You don't know what you're doing. You've created 20 years longitudinal study. It tells us that, in fact, your, the, the, the welfare of women has degenerated considerably or exponentially as a result of what? As a result, or after at least these policies had been implemented. Now, why is this the case, or what should we think about? I mean, feminists know, uh, even the second wave feminists, that there are differences, considerable physiological and psychological and even biological, as we know. Differences between men and women. But basically their, their argument is, despite all of these differences, that we should be treated the same. Now, the burden of proof is upon the one who's making the claim. Why do we need to be on the back foot? 
If, they, if someone asks you, why is it different for whatever ruling it is in Islam or whatever other system even, that differentiates between ruling a man and a woman? So why is it different? Why should it be the same, in fact? Plato, he made a very interesting he's a quote, uh, Aristotle quotes him. He says, treat like cases as like. Meaning, identical things should be treated identically. And different things, by extension, should be treated what? Differently. Now, your feminism doesn't accommodate for the differences between men and women. That's a failure. That means it has less explanatory scope. Now, why should we cover for their failure or even accept it as a pre presupposition for answering their questions? They're asking, why is it that we'll come to it? But why is the inheritance difference? Why is polygamy? Why is man can marry this and that? Why should it be the same, in fact? Who, 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 why is there an assumption of equality, of absolute equality? This assumption itself is unsubstantiated. And in fact, they need to argue it f from first principles. They need to argue why it should be different things should be treated the same. They need to argue that, not us. And in fact, this is one of the key reasons, and very important here, why ridda happens, why apostasy happens, or why shak happens, or why raib happens in a deen or a doubt. And we, because we've been in the back foot for too long, have not been able to answer this properly. We, the way we answer it is, so sorry, are you, is the assumption that different things should be treated the same. We believe that Identicality in value does not mean, so equality in value does not mean identical, identicality in roles. One more time. Equality of value. We do believe men and women are equal in value. Yeah, in spiritual value they are equal. Equality of value is, is not equivalent to identicality in roles. This is an extremely important sentence. Memorize it. If they want to tell us that it should be the case, they have to argue for it. It's not me that has to argue for it. But you know what? Sometimes it's quite easy. And it's quite straightforward if we point to them the differences between men and women. Because some of them are actually ignorant of it. Even though the feminist founding fathers were not ignorant of it. In the, in, in the chapter biology, the Beauvoir, she goes, women are weaker than men. She will lose to them in the fight. She has less control of herself. I'm paraphrasing. But that's the idea. She says all this thing. But sometimes you have to show them that that is, that is a fact. Let's, 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 giving, let's give some examples of that. So this, these are three studies I'm giving you, right? There's one of sexual differences, hormonal differences, and cognitive differences. Cognitive, the way you think, right? So let's start with the sexual differences. Roy Baumeister uh, and Kathleen Cantonese, yeah? This is a study of 2001, big study. One of the biggest I've seen, I think, is one of, if not the biggest. I'm going to read the abstract, just the abstract of the study. Sex difference, the sex difference, yeah? It says the following, it says, The sex drive refers to the strength of sexual motivation across many s different studies and measures. Men have been shown to have more frequent and more intense sexual desires than women, as reflected in spontaneous thoughts about sex, frequency and variety of sexual fantasies, desired, a desired frequency of intercourse, desired number of partners, masturbation. What are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding. I was going to say you're on TV, be careful. No, no, ma masturbation, w where were we? Uh, 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 liking for vi various se sexual practices, willingness to forego sex, or lack thereof, uh, limit, uh, initiating versus refusing sex, making sacrifices for sex and other such measures. She, listen to what he says. And there's a woman in this as well. Uh, Kathleen Cantonese. No contrary findings. This is categorical. Using a huge quantifier. No! Yeah, negating. No contrary findings indicate stronger sexual motivation among women were found. Hence, we conclude that the male sex drive is stronger than the female sex drive. The gender difference in sex drive should not be generalized to other constructs such as sexual orgasm orgasmic capacity, enjoyment of sex, and so on. Of course, they can't check, check that. But this is what? This is the strongest thing you have. You're going to tell us that there's a... Why should different things be treated the same? You see, already when we start outlining the differences, we start realizing, should there not... The question comes up, doesn't it? Should there not be some kind of catering for this difference? Okay, that's sexual difference. Is there any other difference? Yes, of course. Homo hormonal difference. A woman has anything between one-tenth to one-twentieth the amount of testosterone a man has. One-tenth to one-twentieth. Now, you're telling me that has no effect? That has a huge effect. And as we're going to find with the second bit, it even has a cognitive impact. Not just a, a physical one. A phys physically, yes. It has sexual uh, implications. But it has physical on, uh, implications on strength, speed. All of these things. All of these implications. H hormones are no joke. You know, when a woman has one tenth to one twentieth, anything between one tw tenth to one, you can't tell me that we're going to have the same laws on every single thing in the absolute. Why should it? 
Moreover now, cognitive differences. Diane Halpern herself, she, she came into it. She was starting her, she started a, 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 she, a, her study saying she didn't expect to find much differences. She said she revised her understanding. She has a whole book now. It's called The Sex Differences Between Men and Women. The, she says there's cognitive, sizable, she says, sizable cognitive differences between men and women. Cognitive means the way you think. I'm not saying it means that women are cleverer than women. I'm not saying that. But there are sizable cognitive differences. And in fact, let me, let me say something interesting. This is, um, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this person's name. Namrata Apod Yeah, 2014 is a conclusion of a study. Yeah, And this connects hormones to cognitive ability. In conclusion, the study says, Male cognitive functions, viz. attentional, perceptual, executive and working memory, were comparable to those of female pre-ovulatory phase cognitive functions. <laughs> yani menstruation has an impact. Listen to what he says. This might be due to the analogous action of testosterone and estrogen on the brain. Thus, our study supported the fact that testosterone and estrogen accentuated cognitive functions in a similar fashion. Both men and women or both males and females, pre-ovulatory phase, so women in the pre-ovulatory phase, right, can compete with uh, each other equally in cognitive tasks. However, listen, males outperform females in attention state, as was assessed by visual reaction time, during the post-ovulatory phase of their menstrual cycles. Naqisat akhl wa deen, the hadith says. They are, the, the women are deficient. Women are deficient in aql, which means, basically, aql is not ilm. Aql is, 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 is emotional ability. That's what it's talking about. Aql comes from the Arabic word aqal, which is basically when you put like a, the reins of a horse and you move it left and right. So basically the hadith is saying women are less emotion, more emotional than men. Now this, uh, well, if I read this, it's the same thing. Well, he's saying that when the women are ovulating, they have issues with cognition or is their cognition is inhibited. What's the problem? So if the hadith didn't say that, it would be unscientific. So you have an issue with the hadith? Let me get you some studies. I can get you 20 studies. Show you. I just gave you one for brevity. Well, I'll get you 20. But when the white man says it, in this case it was an Indian actually. But when the white man says it, with a lab coat, you accept. But when the Muslim says it, or in this case Prophet Muhammad himself, you don't accept. That's because you are indeed a kafir. Not all of them, of course. Some of them have shak. But some of them have kufr. Some of them are kafir, disbelievers. And they pretend to be Muslim. And they actually roll, let's put it in... S street language, they roll with feminism as their religion and they pretend to be Muslims. Let's be honest about it. it because this is a religion, even uh, as per what this woman said. Before they used to have religions which were statues and stuff like that, Sanam, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the golden uh, calf and all these things. Uh, now they have ideologies and some people say, you know what, I don't actually believe this Muhammad stuff and uh, you know, this heaven and hell stuff. In their head, you know the thing, they're thinking, I believe in, I believe in equality. Uqsum Billah Al-Azim is a religion and Uqsum Billah Al-Azim is one of the major reasons why people have rid of Islam. Uqsum Billah Al-Azim. And, and we have these munafiqat. Munafiqeen and munafiqun munafiqat. We have these hypocrites in the community, Islam, Islam community, that they pretend to be Muslim but they believe in this stuff and they believe it more than Islam and they will reject Islam because of it. Uqsum Billah Al-Azim, they reject Islam deep down in their heart, they don't believe in it. And some of them are not on that level yet. Some of them, the, these kinds of things, like the hadith that I've just mentioned, it will cause them shak in their heart, but it wouldn't take them out of the religion of Islam. And that, I'll, I hope to say, is probably the majority. It causes them severe doubts, but, it doesn't, but there are some, a, a sizable chunk, who we, we cannot say, uh, they are like that. So we have to be careful. Because this stuff inside of it is riddah. This we're talking about aqidah. You know, this is, uh, this is number one in the aqidah thing. You, you, you don't believe what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, you oppose it directly because of some other foreign ideology, that means that you are more inclined to Ridda than you are to Islam. It's like, it's like um, they're taking the aql over the naql. Yes, they're taking the aql over the naql. But they don't even have the aql, unfortunately. But the thing is, that's exactly what Iblis done. Exactly. That's, that's yes. exactly what he said. Logically, he said yeah. to them. Mm. And he, reju he rejected the naql, which Allah said. Subhanallah. Allah, well, it's he true, yeah. The it's the same thing. But before, Allah, you know the Mu'tazila and those guys? Yeah. They had more right to do that. Because they were taking principles which they thought were logic itself, like maths. Yeah. They think it was mantiq. These guys, they, they're taking the opinions of white women. A lot of them are racist. They, they want to lynch the blacks. They're taking these opinions and they're putting it over the opinions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because they don't believe he was actual a prophet. But they pretend to believe in it for the social benefits. It's inferiority complex. And that yes. You know when Allah talks about um, muftads, and he talks about they don't, um, he talks about Allah will replace them. 
with a group of people who love Allah and they do not care about the blame of the blamers. Yes. Because if you think about it, Allah's talking about the psychology of the murtads. Mm. They're very insecure. Somebody will come and say this and that. That's why they go with this rather than the Quran and the Sunnah. It's true, Allah. Yeah, that's exactly what it's true. But so this is the point. We've given three examples of sizable difference between men and women in cognitive, biological, and psychological terms. And there are so many examples. I, it's, it's, it will be unscientific for someone to come and say, you know, it's, no, there's no difference. It will be, and even the feminists don't say that. So that's not even, we're not trying to straw man their argument. But the lay people, they will say that. See, there's not much cognitive difference. But then when you show them the, uh, the studies, and that, oh, there are cognitive differences. Yeah, well, you, you just changed your mind, didn't you? All right, so if there are cognitive differences and if there are psychological differences, uh, I'm not saying that there are, one is better than the other. We believe at takamul. We believe in, when the Prophet Muhammad said, which can be translated as musawiyat. Yeah, it can be like equal in value. But it also means mutakamilat, which means that they are complementing men. Men and women are like mirror images of one another. They, they complement one another. So we believe in complementarity over equality. We believe that there are some things that we don't have. That do not wish what the other one has. Men shouldn't wish what women have, and women should. There are things that women exceed, and well, uh, go over and above what men can do, and vice versa. We shouldn't want what the other one has. It's simple as that. There are some things that men have that women don't have, and vice versa. And when, when we use the uh, breastfeeding example or the gi giving birth example, they say, well, that's trivial. Why are you giving, using that? It's, it's almost offensive. Why is it offensive? That's huge. W men are more dis uh, dispensable than women in many ways because you can freeze uh, uh, sperms, but you can't, you, can't <laughs> freeze, you can't freeze wombs. You need a womb. You know, uh, if you want the continuation of the human species, you need women. Okay, and you need them to be alive. So in many ways, men are more dispensable. We're not saying that, we, that we're not, this is not a polemic against women, but this is a polemic against second wave feminism, okay? So we talked about the differences. Now, uh, in the backlash literature, you'll, you'll find, for example, The Myth of Male Power. It's a very good book. I've recommended it before and I recommend it. Obviously, he's coming from more like a liberal, maybe egalitarian background, but he still makes very, very good points. And he makes the point, he defines power in a different way because the question of what's a patriarchy, because that's another big thing with second wave feminism. They say, well, there's, a, there's an oppressive class and there's the oppressed. The men are the, the oppressors, and then you have the oppressed. Well, he says, why do you say that? He says, because there's a distribution of power which is uneven. He says, how do you define power? And so Farrell says that he, he defines power of someone's ability to take control over their own life. He says, when men are being forced to go into war, like in drafting the armies and stuff, he says, is that power? Or is that lack thereof? It is lack of power, because you don't, you're, you're being forced to do something you don't want to do. Women have never, almost in all of history, have been forced en masse to go into war and fight and die for the country. But that's happened civilizationally across all history and almost all civilizations since the beginning of time and civilization four or five thousand years ago. Okay, so that, that's, that's the difference. Suicide rates are different between men and women. There's, there's a, a difference there. There's differences in dangerous jobs. How many women apply for dangerous jobs? Like, for example, you see quotas being discussed, especially in second wave discourse, or oh, we should have quotas, we should have equal representation in parliaments. I've never seen quotas being discussed outside of the, the trash uh, onyx or whatever it's called. We need to have equality here. Well, well, how come you don't want equality in the army? How come you don't want equality in, in coal mining? How, how come I've never seen one single article? Maybe there is, I'm not saying. But these people, like for, 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 by and large, they don't ask for that. They don't ask for across the board equality. They ask for equality where it benefits them. Yeah? And it's the same privileged, entitled attitude as we saw with those racists in the first wave. It's not, they don't care about equality and uh, human, humanity and stuff like that. They don't have that belief. They just want to privilege themselves and they're using ideological arguments to do so. But you know what? Those particular individuals, they're throwing a boomerang and it's already hitting them in the face. And it will continue hitting them perpetually in the face because they realize they have gone against the fitrah, the natural predisposition of... The, the psychological, the physiological, the, uh, the differences between men and women. They don't, they don't want to realize their own instincts. They're going to end up just like the f founding mothers of feminism, in a regretful state, pitiful, uh, regretful state where they're making retractions and wish I, I, I mourn for this and I, I wish I could have. And Why don't you just realize from the very beginning that actually there are differences and that you should take care of those differences. That's what you should really rea realize from the beginning. So yeah, these are these are some things. Now there's some we're going to talk about next week. Third wave feminism. And some new concepts started to become popularized. So Kimberly Crenshaw came and she talked about intersectionality in 1987 in her article. It was a journal article, and she says and they they started to 
speak about actually it's not like just man and woman. So wh we talked about patriarchy, but you'll be surprised to find that third wave feminists actually attack second wave feminists a lot on this point. I'll give you an example that I thought of myself and I'll read out what Judith Butler said, but before that, for example, if for imagine a situation in, in America, yeah, you had slavery, the transatlantic slave trade and all this kind of thing, yeah? You have a white man and a white woman, they have slaves, black slaves, yeah? Now you couldn't argue that, for example, if a white man and a white woman, or even a white woman has a black slave, that that black man, n man, is taking advantage of what? The white woman, or that he's in a power, he has a power superiority over her. You can't argue that. Why? Because there are different layers of power um, kind of uh, struggle here. And the same thing can be said of the entire, if you like, Western Hemisphere comparative to the colonized world. How could you c compare the colonized tribes in Sub-Saharan Africa or in Middle East or Asia with those who are benefiting from that project, in this case men and women, in the West? So this binary, this dichotomous, this uh, dualistic, this what Edward Said refers to as didactic representation, yeah, where you have the hero and the, uh, and the anti or the villain. You know, the, the woman who is being oppressed and the man who is oppressing her perpetually all through history. It's actually an untenable thesis. Because when you start looking at all of these, to use the feminist understanding, intersectional, different layers of identity. Well, you're not just a woman, are you? You're a disabled woman. You're a black woman. You're a black man. You're a white man. You're Asian. You're whatever. You have this much money. When you, when you start doing a multifactual analysis, you realize that you can't just say, well, or men have been oppressing women all, all through the countries, uh, the societies and civilization. You can't say that. Depends on what man you're talking about. Depends on what woman you're talking about. Depends on what power relations you're talking about. And in fact, it depends on how you define power, as we've just seen. There are so many definitions of power. Don't ever just in argument accept their definition of how do you define power. Robert Dahl said that it's the ability for person A to get person B to do something that person B would otherwise not do. Backrats and Barris had some other understanding. Foucault believed power was like a fog, that it, it was everywhere. It, there's no, there is no consensus on what power is in the first place. And power informs the, the theories of justice and oppression. So for th they have a lot to prove, qu quite frankly. They have to, they have to use a very uh, classical definition of power, and then they have to define that power as oppressive. And for them, as we've said, they were starting off by saying that just by a man being in charge of a woman in any capacity, that's oppressive. Warren Farrell makes a very good point. He says a woman in a responsibility in a corporate environment, where, she, for example, she's like a manager, yeah? She mentions this in his book, The Myth of Male Power. And she's like, let's say, for example, a woman that's working in a corporate environment, and she's looking after five people. The manager comes and says, look, you've got five more people that you have to look after now, yeah? So it's ten people you have to look after. She's going to see that as an expansion of what? Power. Because it's responsibility. But when she, she would never see the same thing about having more children, even though it's also an expansion of responsibility. Why? Because they've denigrated the domestic environment. But it's like for like, in fact, the influence that she's going to have on the kids is going to be more than the influence that she's going to have on the employees. Much more, in fact. But one is regarded as, because it's within a capitalistic framework, and the li remember, the liberal feminists, f second wave liberal capitalistic feminists is what the culture is. Although, th obviously, there are f Marxist feminists and so on. There's, there's different uh, syntheses, if you like. But the idea here is this. Don't accept their definitions. And you're not on the back foot. In fact, they're on the back foot. And this is a very important point. Judith Butler talks about a patriarchy. And she says something. She, I'm, I'm going to read it out. The political assumption that there, there must be a universal basis for feminism, one which must be found in an identity assumed to exist cross-culturally, often accompanies the notion that the oppression of women has some singular form discernible in the universal or hege hegemonic structure of patriarchy or mascul masculine domination. The notion of patriarchy has wickedly been criticized in recent years for its failure to account for the workings of gender oppression in concrete cultural contexts in which it exists. That form of feminist theorizing has come into criticisms for its efforts to colonize and appropriate non-Western cultures to support highly Western notions of oppression. This is who? This is Judith Butler, the third wave feminist. She's attacking the patriarchy. She's saying it's coming to question, or she at least she's outlining the problems with it. Yeah. They tend to construct a third world or even an orient in which gender oppression is subtly explained as symptomatic of an essential non-Western barbarism. Now, I just want to end with, uh, basically, uh, this is, uh, th bring it back to Islam. We've done 45 uh, minutes, so hopefully this will be the last thing I say, and then we can have a discussion, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go and pray. Actually, we'll pray and then we'll have a discussion. But <coughs> some key verses we talked about 
uh, is or that we need to know about is obviously Ar Rijal Al Qawmun An Nisa, chapter four, verse thirty-four, and this is under attack, probably the most under attack verse in the Quran. Because why? Because it does imply that there's some kind of hierarchization between men and women, especially managerially within the domestic environment. It does imply that. It's very difficult to not get that from the verse. If you try and pretend there's equality, you'll lose the argument. You, 434 does imply domestic hierarchization. doesn't mean that men are more valuable than women, but it doesn't mean that men are, have a managerial role within the domestic environment in familial settings, which is, uh, has more responsibility than women. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَةً in chapter 2 verse 228 Surah Al-Baqarah that for men there's a degree of responsibility over them at tabari mentions this is a uh, this is a daraja of mas'uliyah of responsibility so men have more responsibility domestically they have a protective role and as such they also have a hierarchy which means that they so long as they're not going against the rights of the woman and this is a, this is a big so long as right and they're not going against la ta'at al-makhluq fi ma'siyat al-khaliq which is you're not allowed to believe in the creation in the, uh, or obey the creation in the disobedience to the Creator. And they're not telling her to do something that will harm her. These are the three conditions. If these three conditions are met, then he, he is the one who is calling the shots, quite frankly. Let's put it this way, yeah, in the house. So if that's the case then, how can you explain that if you're a feminist Muslim? You'd have to do what Amina Wadud did, which is kufr. She said, I read 434 and I had what she says as a conscientious gap. She even wrote no, N-O. What do you mean no? She said, no, yani, what, you're saying no to me or Allah? Yeah, no, khalas, no to Islam. Why are you calling yourself a Muslim? Take your hijab off, leave. Don't pretend to be Muslim. If you say no to a verse of the Quran, no, conscientious gap, leave it, don't pretend to be a Muslim. Don't pre uh, this is my point. So here the thing is, this is the danger. And this kind of thought is, is, is widespread in, in Western circles. We have to hit it full head on. And the way to hit it is not to, to apologize and accept their assumptions. We don't accept their assumptions. We don't accept that there should be equality because they, they only have a problem with that verse because of the assumption of equality. We say, why do you assume equality? Prove it from first principles. The, the bayina or the burden of proof in the bayina to alam mudai. As the hadith says, it's actually a logical principle. The burden of proof is upon the one that makes the claim. That the, 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 the burden of proof is upon the one that's making the claim. You're making the claim that despite the physiological differences and the psychological differences and the biological differences between men and women, that despite all of that, there should be equality, that different things should be treated the same. You prove it. I'm going to sit back here in my chair. You prove it. I don't need to prove it. Halas, then you have lost the argument. I'm not going to be here. Why should I be the one doing all the work for you and trying to prove these things? Why should, why should there be 434? Why shouldn't there be? This because it shows hierarchization. Give them, uh, sorry, it does show hierarchization. Domestic familial hierarchization. Yes. What now? Oh, but that's what shows your religion is oppression. Why? You've already assumed that there should be equality between men and women in all cases. Can you prove that? They'll watch them squirm after that. Watch them. They'll squirm in front of your faces because they have nothing. They have nothing. They have no way of proving it from first principles. So you have to, don't ever sacrifice. We have to never sacrifice our qat'ayat in the religion of Islam for their pleasure. Oh, this doesn't mean this. Oh, well, it means this. Uh, we're not going to do that. Yeah. And there is such a thing as ta, which means obedience to man, to the husband. There is such a thing. It's in the Quran. It's not even in the Hadith. So, oh, what, the, where? It's in the 434 itself. For in if they obey you, <laughs> try and find me something like for like for a man, where oh, he has to obey the woman. No, only if she's a political leader, yeah, or his mother. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing, that, however, having said that, there are some misconceptions. Okay, there are so, so we talked about this stuff, all this stuff. There are, so, there are some things that are true that just don't agree with. They don't agree with polygamy. They don't agree with men can marry Jews and Christians and women can't. They don't agree with the ta'a or the obedience. They don't agree with qawama. They don't agree with domesticity. They don't agree with any of that stuff. But, they, but there are some things they just get wrong. For example, they talk about honor killings. And they genuinely believe that this is in Islam. There's nothing such as honor killings in Islam. They talk about FGM and mutilating this and that. The way they understand it is wrong, is incorrect. And in fact, they're the ones who are perpetrating <laughs> FGM. According to the World Health Organization, FGM is if you have labiaplasty. They have labiaplasty. You know what labiaplasty is? Labia, when they tighten the vagina, sorry to say. Yani. So that they, because they've had so much intercourse, gone here, gone there. All that. So they tighten it up for the man's pleasure, ironically enough. They, where is that happening? It's happening in the UK. It's happening in the US. Look, look at the articles. That, what's that called? It's called the FGM, according to the WHO. Why? But it's cosmetic. It's cosmetic. You're not going to call it FGM? But still, according to the WHO interpretation, it is FGM. And, and the most FGM of that nature is happening here in the West. Piercings, vaginal piercings, it goes under the bloody WHO, World Health Organization's uh, thing of 
How many, you tell me, go to Egypt, go to Pakistan, go to Indonesia and ask a thousand women, how many of you have uh, a piercing in your vagina? And then go here and ask. But they'll say, they'll say it's consent. No problem. Uh, the, the, the WHO uh, definition doesn't say consent or lack thereof. If you can, uh, is consensually mutilating yourself. <laughs> That's according to you, you're consensually mutilating yourself. We're not talking about your children and all this. Thing. We're talking about you, you are. Cons yes, it's a good point, though. That is what they'll say. We're saying that you still defi it is still defined as mutilation according to your definitions. And another problem is inheritance. So inheritance, they, they, they say that men get more than women. That's not correct. In fact, if we, if we break it down, uh, there are four cases in which females get 50% of what a male gets. لِذَّكَرِي مَثْلُ حَذُ الْأُنْتِيَيْنِ Yeah? Where the brother gets more than the, f uh, thing, the, sister, the sister. But there are 11 cases where a female gets the same as a male. For example, وَلِي أَبَوَاهُ لِكُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِنْهُمَ السُّدُسْ مِمَّا تَرَكْ إِنْ كَانَ لَهُمْ وَلَدٍ إِنْ كَانَ لَهُمْ وَلَدٍ If, uh, you know, that the father and the mother gets one-sixth if there's a boy. There's 11 such cases where the female gets the same as the male. And th there are six cases where the, where the f it should be the female gets more than the male. Yeah? Uh, the f the f yeah. yeah. There's yeah. 14 cases yeah. where a woman gets more than... Uh, there's, a, there's one case where a woman gets 14... Um, she gets more than 14 uh, male family members. Like by, uh, more than the grandson, the father, grandson, yeah, grandson, yeah, 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 yeah. Brother. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So th it's a misconception. Yeah. Th these, these things are misconceptions. So we do need to delineate the misconceptions from what they, but we don't lie. We don't say like, you know, hijab is not compulsory or uh, polygamy is not in Islam or whatever. But these things are there because of the lack of uh, equality, absolute equality. We believe in general equality. I mean, b us and the feminists both believe in a general equality, but we have different exceptions. Because the Prophet said, in the man of Shaykh al they're equal, but there are exceptions. Our exceptions are different to theirs. Some of them don't even have exceptions. Ngozi, the woman who wrote the, the feminist manifesto, she said the only exception should be breastfeeding. So she would rule out things like maternity leave and so on. Some of them make the case for exceptions, and some of them don't. Some of them make the case that women should be given a head up so that they can catch up with men. And some of them don't make those cases. So we have to be nuanced and see who's making the argument. But bear that all in mind. So obviously, f in summary, we believe that Allah, that Allah knows, is he not, does he not know what he created and he is the all subtle, all aware. He knows what Allah, he, cre he knows what he created, he created the man, he created the woman, he created the biologies of those people, he created the uh, psychology and so on, and he knows what uh, to give each. And that's it. We believe the Prophet Muhammad is a final prophet, he's an actual prophet that is speaking on behalf of God on earth, and that anything that he says is wahi, is revelation, it's not something with a human construct or social construct. Uh, and that will, uh, that is how we, d that's how we actually argue it. So say, well, why do you believe in what you believe in? We believe in it because we believe we can prove God's existence from first principles. We can prove that Prophet Muhammad is the prophet, is the prophet. And then whatever, uh, so therefore anything he says is from God. And because of that, we say that every, uh, all the, uh, the injunctions are true. That's how we prove it. We're not satisfied. But I think we should be more harsh with these people because a lot of them, they want us to change the religion from inside. Wallahi, there, uh, we, we do have uh, you know, sectarian issues, uh, creedal sectarian issues. This should take priority because this means ridda or not. We're, we're still talking about Allah above the arsh or laysa lahu makana wa zaman or these uh, fine things. They won't take you to, th these things are not like this. These things are not like this. These are important creedal discussions, but they're nothing like this. This is someone I say no to, the Prophet Allah, saying no to Allah. And we're, talking, we're squabbling over some issues. Th this woman is saying no. Quran verse because she said no, <laughs> and and then she's got followers, and we're talking about issues uh, which there's ta'wil and no one's saying that Prophet Muhammad is not is a liar. They're basically saying he's a, he's a liar. What do you want? What more do you want? They don't need to say it in uh, in, in that, that clear term, but they, they are implying it. Yeah, one, one's, one's trying to understand Allah, like yeah. and one's saying um, he's a liar. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we it's, 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 it's a nid. It is a nid. It is a nid. This is a, an, it's a statue besides Allah. Yeah. Just like, you know, uh, the summary, he left uh, the people and they, they were taking the golden calf and praying to it. And he came, you know the story in Baqarah and Surah. Uh, you, know, you know what's interesting about that? I was, I was just talking, sorry. Um, is that what the scholars say is the reason why they made a golden calf is because in those days, it was um, like inferior to complex. They had one. Let's do the one. And the Very one good point. Very, well, it's a good point. Feminism. Yes, they, they do exactly, exactly the same thing. thing. Yeah, and but do you know what's funny? They even had some rationale for it because yeah. the, the calf was making noises because the window's yeah, going yeah, through yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. They have some rationale, but it's, it's mantik batil. It's, it's false. It's a uh, ghalit or abatil. 
Uh, and on that note, inshallah, we're going to pray. Jazakumullah khairan, guys. And we're going to be doing this in Arabic as well. We're going to have a discussion. And uh, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.